Good afternoon. This is Stuart Pavlak. I'm the executive director of the Pittsburgh office of the ZOA. Welcome to our webinar today on judicial reform in Israel and why it matters. It is being hosted by myself from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and uh, by our executive director, Steve Feldman from Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania. Personally, I have two pet peeves about the media on its coverage of Israel. I am tired of hearing about Israel's far right wing or radical right wing government. The Israel Democracy Institute took a poll in the summer of 2022 and 62% of respondents identified as being on the right and only 12% identified being on the left. The second item that upsets me is consistently hearing how this government is a threat to Israel's democracy via proposed changes to the Israel Supreme Court, and that is the topic for today. I am a huge fan of Professor Eugene Kontrovich, and I try to read every article I see with his byline. After reading a recent article on the Supreme Court by the professor, I pitched this, office, this uh, webinar to our New York office, and it was approved. My colleague Steve Feldman has been with ZOA for 20 years, and prior to that, he was a journalist for 20 years. Due to his experience, I felt that it would be most appropriate that Steve moderates today's discussion. And he also arranged to bring in our distinguished member of the Knesset, who we hope will log on shortly. Today's guests are a member of Knesset, Simka Rotman, chair of the Knesset's Constitutional Law Just and Justice Committee, and Professor Eugene Kontorovich, director of the International Law Department at the Colette Policy Forum and professor at George Mason's Anton Scalia School of Law. And now I will turn it over to Steve. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon to our audience and Erev Tov to our guests and our viewers in Israel. Welcome, everybody. I am Steve Feldman. I'm executive director of Greater Philadelphia ZOA. And I want to thank my colleague, Stuart, for suggesting this topic and for thinking of me as, uh, as the moderator. And I want to thank my colleagues, Alan Jay, who's our national executive director, and Karen Amoyle. Uh, who are working in the background to make sure this event runs smooth. Uh, and we hope that all of you watching and participating are in good health. This is a, a very special webinar. All of our webinars at ZOA, we like to think are special and important, but this one is, is among the more important. Today, we will cut through rampant media bias uh, and hear the unadulterated facts on a topic of great importance and great interest uh, both to Israel, to the Jewish people, uh, and also, I, I might say, to the world. Today, we're giving you, our audience, the tools to cut through the media bias and outright lies and incitement that are out there about Israel's proposals for judicial reform. And you must use those tools. You must communicate what you hear today on social media, to your email lists, to your friends, to fellow congregants, in blog posts, in letters to the editor, uh, both in Jewish media, general media, and emails and phone calls to your elected officials, and of course, the White House and the State Department. Very important. This advocacy will not be done by someone else. You must do it. We can't wait for others to do it. We must do it. The lies and information that are in the media, that are in the public discourse, have real tangible destructive impacts. So we must make sure that the truth and the facts are seen and heard as least as much as the lies are. This event is being recorded uh, and when it is available, we strongly urge everyone that you watching know to watch it so they also can get the facts. We are honored today. Really, it is an honor and privilege to have with us Knesset member Simcha Rotman, who is chair of the Knesset Constitutional Law and Justice Committee. He is leading the legislative effort on judicial reform. And also who'll be joining us uh, in a little bit is Professor Eugene Kontorovich, who is the 
director of the uh, of international law at the Kohelet Forum, and also a professor of law, and actually has the Antonin Scalia chair at George Mason University. It really is our honor and privilege to have them both with us. Uh, I met uh, with uh, Minister, uh, rather member of Knesset Rodman uh, last spring during Israel, ZOA's uh, fabulous Israel mission. He hosted us in the Knesset. It was really a, a joy and honor to meet him there. Uh, and we're gonna hear from him now since he is leading the uh, legislative the legislative work in the Knesset on these reforms. Uh, member of Knesset, uh, Rodman, please unmute. You're muted right now so we can uh, get underway. Welcome. Yeah, uh, welcome. Hi. Hi, hi welcome, so, welcome so much to, to our uh, webinar today and uh, Erev Tov to you. Uh, you've been in the news a lot uh, as you've been leading this Let's effort. That again. <laughs> Uh, let's begin with, with really a basic question. Why do you and others in the government, in the coalition, believe that judicial reforms are vitally needed, uh, especially, especially regarding Israel's Supreme Court? Um, okay, so Israel, uh, in Israel, we have, a, uh, we have a Knesset that is uh, checked and balanced. Some would say more, too much checks and balances on the Knesset. We have uh, an executive who is checked and balanced, and we have a court that is unchecked and unbalanced. Um, Israel court has power like no any like no other court in the world, and I think Eugene might speak about it even more. But okay, so that's a problem. That okay, so deal with the court. What's the problem? Why is it so important? Why is it so urgent? The answer is very simple: we cannot fight terror if we don't reform the courts. We cannot, um, we cannot deal with prices, rising prices of housing or other issues without reforming the court. We cannot uh, safeguard Israel Jewish identity without reforming the courts. Now, it's a three major uh, declaration. Let's just put them into context, okay? Um, today was passing the Knesset with a big majority, more than 90 Knesset members voted for it, a law that will take citizenship from terrorists that are getting money from the Palestinian Authority because they murdered Jews using their Israeli citizenship. So some would say, why haven't you, the, the Palestinian Authority pays for, pay for slay for so many years why is this law coming only now in 2023? Why, why do you need it even? It's a no-brainer. And you're right, because the Knesset has passed laws like that to take away citizenship from terrorists many times in the past. All the laws were passed with huge majority. It's not a fringe position in Israel to take citizenship from terrorists. And yet, despite the fact that the Knesset has passed so many laws, laws concerning it, you can, I, I don't think you can use your, you don't need more than one finger, I think, because it's the actual number is almost zero uh, of, of, of terrorists that their citizenship was taken away from them. And that's because the court either canceled the laws or um, made them void by interpretation and that's after the laws were passed from the beginning in a way that, the, that minimizes their, their effect because of the threat of the court. So we cannot legislate what we want because, the court, because under a threat that the court will cancel it. And after we're, we're having the diluted version of the law that we want to pass, the court ignores it. So we cannot fight terror like that. We cannot fight terror when, when you try to demolish a house of a terrorist and the court stops it from you and create a, um, a delay in the deterrence against, uh, in the deterrence against terrorists. You cannot fight terror with two hands tied behind your back because of the court. And that's those are examples on fighting terror. If we talk about housing prices, the first chapter of my book, uh, my old book, uh, The Supreme Rulers or, or the, the Ruling Party of Bagats, 
showed that the rising housing prices in Israel what is court made. The government took action, took very serious actions to lower the prices of the housing. And the, and the actions, those actions were canceled by the court in a very strange uh, um, appeal that was brought in front of the court by an organization called Newspeak, believe it or not, um, uh, funded by the New Israel Fund. And one of the arguments there was that um, the, the kibbutzim and the moshavim that have land in, for agriculture cannot benefit from this land. One of the arguments was because it's a theft from the Arabs. So, so then that's put a hold on getting land to development of new housing development. So that's a court-made decision that created a, a, a huge, a huge uh, uh, um, uh, block on the supply of land for, for housing in Israel. And I can talk about the Jewish identity. Um, we, we didn't come here from all over the world that uh, practicing Jews will be afraid to go to hospitals, private owned hospitals that say, we want to keep kosher here. We don't want to let people bring in bread during Passover. And there are people that won't go to hospital if they're afraid that it's not kosher enough. And the court said, no, no, you have to let them bring in bread in the hospital, in the Jewish, in the only Jewish country around the world. And it's a free, it's an issue of freedom for seven days. You cannot finish your sandwich before you get into the hospital. <laughs> so, so, so those crazy rulings by this, and I'm not even starting to talk about the fact that the, the very basic law of the Israel is the homeland of the Jewish people was challenging the court on the idea that it goes against the basic structure of the Israeli non-existent constitution. And one of the judges actually made a decision that a law that said that Israel is the homeland of the Jewish people is an unconstitutional constitutional change. If you can wrap your head around this, you can understand why we need urgently to reform the judiciary. I yeah. think I answered. Now you you represent you you're a member of the Religious Zionist Party. Uh, you've been in the Knesset since 2021, but you've been concerned about this issue for many many years before you you were elected. You actually were active uh, of the with the movement for governability and democracy. So this is not something that you decided to work on when you got elected. Can you go through uh, as, as simply as possible the reforms that you are suggesting? Give our viewers and our audience really what, what you and your colleagues in, in the government want to do, want to accomplish. Okay, so, so what we're trying to do now is um, the first step that you must, uh, um, in order to legislate anything, again, fight terror, to fight housing prices, to, fight, to, to deal with any important issue in Israel, is to make sure that what the legislator legislates actually stays a legislation. Now, today in the judicial, today in the, in the committee, in the, in, the, in the Constitution Committee, um, we have uh, a law saying the simple, stating the obvious, and it's quite sad that we need to state that, that the court cannot cancel basic laws. If we don't have a constitution, the court should never have the power to cancel basic laws. Second is to change the way we select our judges. Uh, Israeli uh, way of selection, selecting judges is undemocratic. As I said, Israeli court is the only court in the world that I know of. Maybe you can find some strange examples, but definitely uh, that's not uh, very common. And I'm saying that in an understatement in the democratic world, the judges are not selected by the public, by the body politic of the public. And, and uh, uh, if you talk, the, take the American example for that's of course the president and the Senate. If you take the Canadian example, that's the prime minister by himself. If you take uh, other countries, it's either the parliament or the executive or a combination thereof. That's the common situation, and that Israel does not have it. Israeli Supreme Court justices 
can actually block anyone that they dislike to join their uh, their ranks. So so uh, that change needs to be done, and um, we are reforming the judicial selection committee and making it. Um, and the funny thing about it is, people blamed us for uh, trying to create a dictatorship. So for the first time in the history of the state of Israel, I am putting in that they have to that the opposition must have a seat in the judicial selection committee because I'm such a dictator, and also um, I'm I'm saying that any any judge, any justice in the Supreme Court will be appointed only after he has a public hearing in the committee, in the, in the Constitution Committee, when we have seven members of the opposition that will be able to ask him whatever questions they want. Again, very undemocratic of me. So, uh, and, and that's two things that do not exist today. Today, the way we select our judges is more secret than Israeli, um, and according to foreign uh, sources, at atomic uh, 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 protocols. So, um, so that's uh, we need we need to uh, do this and 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 that the second part. The third part is what we call the override clause. It's not a, it's not such a good term, but that's the term in, they use in Israel. Piscati Gabru, the override clause. It's basically said that the law will be able for the first time again will get the authority to cancel laws of the Knesset, but in order to do so, you will have to do it with all 15 Supreme Court justices sitting on the case, not by a random decision of someone or some, even worse, not random, that the Chief Justice decided I am assigning this judge or this judge when I know the outcome. So it has to be the full panel. And then there is difference. My position is that you need to be like a jury in the US, uh, unanimous vote, all the 15 should vote uh, uh, to, undo, to undoing so, and uh, Yariv Levin, the justice minister, is, is say he's more liberal than me. He says 13 out of 15 doesn't. It's, it doesn't really matter. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's something that needs to be um, crafted later. And the Knesset can override this. Again, I'm reminding anyone: Israel does not have a constitution. So if the court cancels the law, it's because it's contradict the basic law. It doesn't make any sense that the basic law that was passed by 30 Knesset members will be stronger than the regular law that was passed by 61 Knesset members in all three readings. So I'm allowing the Knesset to do an, uh, uh, like a, a, a special law that is stronger than the basic laws for that matter. It's acting temporary until the next, yeah. <laughs> the next Knesset will approve it. In 60, again, in 61, so it's super majority. And um, and the fourth part is the court uh, cannot uh, cancel a decision by an executive elected official just because he thinks that it's unreasonable. Believe it or not, in Israel, if I don't like the uh, the equivalent in Israel, I try to say it in an American term. Just imagine, I think Blinken is not suitable for the job, and I want to go to the Supreme Court directly to the Supreme Court of the U.S. and say. I don't like the way Blinken spoke about Israel. Yeah, I, I think he's not good enough to be a Secretary of State in the in the U.S. And the court will say, mm, you know what, you're right. It's unreasonable, and we'll kick him out of office. That's like we call it in Israel Monday or Tuesday, depends. So <laughs> that's a regular situation in Israel that someone goes to the Supreme Court directly and says, I don't like this official. I think he's bad for the state. And the court will listen to him and then say, oh, it's unreasonable. Yeah, you're right. Or yeah, no, it is reasonable. The reasonable. Israel is a country that is ruled by its judiciary. It wasn't such a problem if the judiciary was elected. It's unelected. It's un unbalanced, unchecked, and definitely biased. And so there's so there's four main reforms that, that are on the table. Yeah. OK. Uh, thus far, you've been extraordinarily courageous in, in pressing ahead with this, with all of the, the rancor, the protests, the media bias, the some of the statements that are, have been outrageous, calling for violence, uh, as you're aware. There's also been reports that there may be some compromise. President Herzog is trying to supposedly broker some sort of a comp compromise with the opposition. Where do you see that? headed? Do you think there will be, can be, some sort of a compromise to, to calm down uh, public uh, on these matters? Um, 
we said, and then when I'm saying we, I said the Justice Minister Levine and myself, um, we said that, of course, if the president that we deeply respect wants to try to get the opposition to show some responsibility and have a negotiation, and I think everyone agrees that this kind of reform, it's better if you can to, pa to pass it in the big, um, with, a, with a large majority, why not? And there are a lot of things that are important to, uh, and actually I chose specifically the, the part that um, talks about the override clause. I chose it specifically. I took it word by word from, an, from an, a, a bill that was passed in former Knesset, in last Knesset. It was passed in the preliminary reading and then we had five members of the opposition that voted for it. So I specifically chose, uh, for me, it's less than perfect version in order to get the opposition to say to them, listen, I took your version, the version that you voted for, just come and sit on the table and we'll do it together, coalition and opposition, because you know this reform is long awaited and much needed. And I chose this specifically, and yet they still say that it's terrible and it's going to ruin the state of Israel. Why? They voted, they voted for it just a year ago. So uh, I try, and I think that's the best way to push forward the reform, to get as much support as you can. But of course, we cannot let the minority dictate with violence uh, uh, the legislation. So the fact that the president wants to broker a negotiation, I am all for it, and I'm very happy. The fact that uh, I, I, we are willing to sit and talk, and of course, when you sit and talk, you, you see what that's the way negotiation in the political world works. We're not afraid of negotiation, but we will not delay the, the legislation because there is no need for delay. And definitely we will not compromise with what's important, that the people in Israel will have the same rights that any other democratic country have to choose their judges, uh, that it won't be uh, uh, that it won't be a, a decision by a self-perpetuating uh, that uh, court that uh, that appoints the same people over and over again. One of the one of the the, the former chief justice Barak was asked in an interview just few few uh, few years ago. I don't know, and also I think it was repeated uh, a few days ago. He was asked, how come the court is so unrepresented representative of the state of Israel? How come you didn't have a Moroccan a Jewish a, a, a judge, which is a big part of the population in Israel? And he said, we couldn't find one. <laughs> now, of course, he was looking in, the, in his own neighborhood, in the same, uh, the same two houses in one street in Jerusalem. He just couldn't find anyone. There are people that are appointing each other, their friend, their family. You, you know who you know who Aaron Barak he'd find? He found his wife and he appointed her when she was starting learning law school. She went to law school at the age of 40. And she was appointed very fast up the scale. He found her. He found his wife. He knows how to find people. But apparently he couldn't find one Moroccan judge to appoint because it was too hard. Now that's just an example of what we're talking about. We're talking about people that are self-appointed and, 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 and they can't even look outside the window and understand the distance, the ever-growing distance between them and the public in Israel. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for spending time with us today, for explaining this to, to our audience. Uh, you really, you and your colleagues are really doing important work uh, and, and may Hashem bless you and and protect you from, from the mob. God willing, there won't be any violence uh, and the democrat, democratic process uh, will go forward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, thank you. Uh, and before we go to our next guest, Professor Eugene Kantorovich, uh, I wanna remind people that ZOA has a, an upcoming, really once in a lifetime mission to Israel. I was on uh, the ZOA mission last year 
um, which was uh, once in my lifetime uh, to have such a mission. I've been to Israel before, but it was an extraordinary mission. And in the chat, uh, I believe we're going to be putting uh, a link to get more information about the Israel mission, which is taking place this June. If you have the time, if you have the ability, I strongly urge you to go. Uh, you will see and meet people that, that you will not meet and places you will not go to on anybody else's mission other than ZOAs. It is Israel's 75th anniversary of its of the modern state, ZOAs, 125th anniversary. So if you can, please try to go on that mission. For those of you who will be in Florida in March, our Florida chapter is having its annual gala. And there will be information about that also placed in the chat. Thank you, Karen, for doing that. Uh, Florida is going to be honoring Mark Levin uh, and a local uh, rabbi and synagogue down there. Uh, so please, if you're in the vicinity of Florida, or if you feel like taking a, a trip to Florida, it's a worthwhile event to be at. And also, before we go to Professor Kantorovich, I want to remind everybody to please support ZOA. There really is only one organization that does the work that ZOA does. Uh, if you're a ZOA member and supporter already, you know this. If this is your first experience with ZOA, you're learning about some of the things that we do. And with your support, we can do even more. Please reach out and support National ZOA, unless you're in the area of one of the chapters, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Florida, Detroit, please support your local chapters. Information will be in the chat room uh, for our uh, respective chapters to, to donate, to contact us. So please do that. Uh, if you're in the Philadelphia area and you want to reach out to us locally, the phone number is 610-660-9466, or you can email us at office at zoaphilly.org and to reach national ZOA, it's info at zoa.org. And all the information is in the chat. And we're gonna go now to Professor Eugene Kantorovich. I, I erred in introducing him earlier. I apologize for that. He is within the law department at the Anthony and Scalia School of Law at George Mason University. He doesn't have a chair. He's got the whole school, I think. Uh, but thank you for joining us, Professor. You really are, uh, I dare say, the, the leading expert in the world on the three subjects that we're going to deal with now, Israeli law, American law, international law. You're involved in, in cases uh, all over. Please uh, begin by reacting to what Knesset member Rotman said, and also uh, comparing and contrasting, because the media does this, or Americans certainly try to compare and equate American law uh, and Israeli law and extrapolate. Please compare and contrast the two systems for our viewers. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I want to start. Uh, I want to start by uh, relating to uh, what um, uh, Mr. Rothman said. But first, uh, I just want to point out to the audience who might not be aware. Um, how truly extraordinarily uh, courageous um, Knesset member Rothman has been and is being. The nobody gives up absolute power lightly. Currently, the judges and professional technocratic elite associated with them wield extraordinary power in Israel. And it's not the kind of power that people give up without uh, without greatly resisting. In doing so, they have tried to whip up an extraordinarily public fervor that in its intensity is unlike anything uh, since perhaps the disengagement um, from Gaza. Uh, the, except in the disengagement from Gaza, the position of the elites was, we don't have to listen to the crowds on the street. Now they're the crowds on the street, they say, we have to listen. Uh, the level of real hatred and um, rancor uh, that uh, goes across all professional norms that I'm sure has been um, directed uh, against Simpa. So extraordinary. And he has stood up to this withering fire. Amazingly, uh, amazingly, and with his head unbowed, 
And this is a uh, this is not just a full-time job. I, I cannot imagine how exhausted he is. This is complete tireless work. There's an effort basically you know, up against Europe, the United States. Um, so anyway, I want to give him full, full credit for this. It's not just that he like, came up with some proposals, uh, wrote some legislation, uh, uh, really an, an extraordinary crucible he's going through uh, with, with, with great grace. Okay, so I want to start, um, first of all, before we contrast it and compare it with America, you know, people say, look, there's a valid point that opponents make. Look, it's apples and oranges. America's different in other ways. Maybe you can't compare. Okay, so the best comparison, what's the closest analogy to Israel? It's not the UK. It's not India, which, which people like to quote for some reason. Um, it's uh, Israel. Israel is the closest country to Israel. And before 1993, 1995, depending on how you count, these the features of the judicial system, the court striking down legislation, the court saying that it can strike down basic laws, that's very new, the court invalidating government uh, action that doesn't violate any law just because they don't like it, the court authorizing the attorney general to pre-veto, to veto uh, government uh, policies uh, even before they're passed. Um, so that the government simply cannot act without the permission of the attorney general, who is picked in part by the judiciary. Uh, all of these are features of the past few decades. Uh, with, with one or two exceptions, almost all of these features have no basis in any legislation whatsoever. They were not decided on by the Knesset. They were never decided on. They were announced by the court. Um, they have been criticized since then. I remember I first became of these, aware of these issues when I read an article in 1999 in Azur, a uh, publication of the Shalem Institute at the, uh, at the time, called The Court That Packed Itself, criticized the justice's ability to control, to dominate the selection of their um, uh, appointees. It has been a controversy for decades, and there have been numerous minor proposals to reform the court all that time, allow for you know at least just public hearings in front of uh, in front of the Knesset. Public hearings? That's disgraceful. They said, "Yeah, you're not going to make us like those clowns in America. Right? We're the boss here. We're, we're not going to appear in front of everyone." These small reforms, all of these incremental reforms, were rejected. People often say, "Why all of it at once?" Because if it's done separately, it's clear it won't work. There's a real danger that at the end of this, the court will do something an American, the American Supreme Court would never do, which is decide on the validity of legislation affecting its own powers. The American Supreme Court said it won't even decide about anything to do with procedures in impeachment cases, because even if it's an executive official being impeached in the particular case, judge, impeachment is a check on the judges. Congress has the power to remove judges for misbehavior. They've chosen not to exercise it, but that's a potential check on the courts. The courts get in, can't get involved in saying if it's okay or if it's not okay. The Israeli, so the Israeli, if any part of this package were uh, 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 passed piecemeal, the Supreme Court would say, you know what? Your amended constitution is unconstitutional. We're the, we, are, have, we are, um, and it's very funny because it's often uh, framed as a conflict between the religious and the secular. It's true that this is a conflict between, in a sense, a religious and secular worldview. So on one hand, you have a group of people who believe that um, a small priestly class, self-created priestly class, um, has a monopoly on the understanding of truth, not relying on traditional legal sources, but by reference to some kind of inspiration that only they possess and people in their line um, possess, and they must have supreme authority over everything, and there's a right answer to every question, and it's their answer. Um, the, uh, on the other hand, there's a group of people who say, you know what, we don't, in public policy, there's no right answer necessarily. There's a lot of answers. How many refugees to take from the Ukraine? Uh, what should be the bar uh, for um, criminal convictions, barring one from the government? It's a range of options. People could disagree. Some people say this, some people say that. Why should we go by? Why? So, you know, the, the best way to figure it out is just uh, go with what the elected government says. 
Now, needless to say, the religious priestly class is the camp of the uh, Supreme Court, the skeptical, pragmatic, uh, practical, epistemologically open people is the uh, is the opponents, um, despite many of them, despite the fact that many of them uh, are are, um, are religious. So this has been going on for uh, for uh, a long time. Now, so the question is, what was the world like in Israel before before this started? It was not so long ago, the early nineties. Right? Rabin was prime minister. Was Israel a dictatorship then? Because the court could not strike down basic laws, because the court had not invented the power of to strike down government decisions they disagree with, because the attorney general did not have veto power over government legislation. No one said it. Right? And it's very funny. Thomas Friedman had a big article in the New York Times. Israel is going to be the end of Israeli democracy. He was the Jerusalem bureau chief of the New York Times from the late 80s to the early 90s. I haven't found his column saying he's come to this <laughs> dictatorship. Uh, now, of course, part of this has to do with the fact that in the early 90s, uh, perhaps the um, the left had calculated that they would win more elections than they now uh, calculate they will. But that's not a constitu that's not a constitutional issue. So we know going back to 1993 does not make it this uh, Israeli dictatorship. And the uh, uh, M.K. Rothman's legislation doesn't take us back then. In fact, it actually gives the court the power of judicial review explicitly for the first time. And maintains a check of um, maintains a check of judicial review. But let's compare with America. Okay, in America, in America, you have a uh, when we say Supreme Court in Israel and Supreme Court in America, people think they're somehow related. There is almost no similarity. The United States Supreme Court. How does it hear cases? Well, it hear cases on appeal, which is already a limitation because lots of facts and rules have already been decided by the lower courts, and it means it can't decide on all the issues in the country. It can't move fast enough, and it can only decide on a, a small number. And there's been facts that have been found in a trial court, not the Israeli Supreme Court. The Israeli Supreme Court, when considering challenges to government action, sits as a court of original jurisdiction, but it can't hear 10,000 trials a year, which is how many petitions it gets. So it decides cases of the greatest national moment. Shall there be a referendum on, on, on the giveaway of national territory to Lebanon based on its own guess at the facts? No evidence is taken without discovery, depositions. As a matter of fact, the Supreme Court found as a fact that the Israel's declared border to the UN with Lebanon was just a pos negotiating position. That was a fact that it, that it found simply by hearing the government's lawyers talk about it. An extraordinary fact to bind the country. So in this sense, it operates different from a court. And Amer the American Supreme Court does not deal, only deals with cases where an individual has been injured in a clear, distinct way. It's called standing. And only once he's been injured. You cannot challenge government policies just because you think they're a bad idea or the government is not complying with, it, uh, with its obligations. Um, where, where large classes of people are identically injured, there's a great system for dealing with that, the Supreme Court calls, and it's called notice and comment in, in agency proceedings or debating it in Congress. Right? If everyone's truly hurt, Congress should deal with it. Israeli Supreme Court deals with questions of who should be the prime minister, who should be a cabinet minister, the conduct of military tactics and the drawing of Israel's borders. Political questions that simply America's Supreme Court would never touch has rejected, has rejected to hear. Um, and so it does not function like a court in that way. It is not a decider of disputes between individuals. And one of the criticisms of the reforms is who's going to protect minority rights? It's a complete red herring. First of all, we have to ask who protected them before 1993. Um, the, and, uh, and secondly, 90% of the controversy about the Supreme Court's decisions are not about decisions that uh, affect uh, individual rights. They're about structural stuff. Because once you can strike down basic laws themselves and remove a prime minister, your power is truly absolute and you control everything else. Everyone's going to uh, uh, have, to, um, have to get in line. The, yeah, I the, can hear Lord Acton saying, I told you so. The absolute power corrupts. Uh, yeah. The... So um, these are simply not the con uh, uh, not uh, not the controversial provisions. Nor has the Supreme Court been a good guardian of human rights. The Supreme Court has upheld 
ethnic discrimination in housing policy. The Supreme Court has held that um, Jews are not allowed to um, limit uh, their uh, sales of land in Jewish towns to Arabs. Very nice. But that Arabs are allowed to limit it to Jews. What about human rights? They have restricted the ability of ultra-Orthodox Haredi Jews to hold public events. Um, and uh, it's just not clear that there are, uh, what happens if the Supreme Court wants to violate human, uh, human, uh, human rights? Israel does not have a Bill of Rights. So when people say rights, no one knows what it means. Uh, people say, talk about equality. We don't have a definition of equality. Right? Basic question about equality. Does it violate equality for Arabs not to be drafted into the IDF? It's a huge question. It sounds like it should be a violation. But to have that decided, that top level question decided by the Supreme Court, as opposed to the Knesset, is absurd. Now, the Knesset has not suggested that, uh, they are, that there's a problem with not drafting them, but they have suggested that there's a problem with giving draft exceptions to Haredim, which is exactly the same question. Um, the, uh, so these are questions where there is no right answer. I want to. I want to take some. Uh, uh, pardon me for. I just want to say one final thing. Go ahead, please. I'm one sorry. of the reasons, you know, in America, if we so one of the re, in America, the current administration recently proposed in response. First of all, said two things that are very important. First of all, they said the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs is lawless, horrible, and not okay. Now, that's an important thing to say. It's legitimate that they said it. It's good that they said it, because it shows us that it's true. Judges can make mistakes. Whether Dobbs was a mistake or Roe versus Wade is a mistake, it's not clear. One of them was a mistake, that's for sure. So judges are fallible. The model of giving complete control to judges that we have in Israel is based on the assumption that they're infallible, which no one in America believes. In response to this, President Biden wanted to pack the court. Packing the court is a much more extreme alternative than anything on the table, anything uh, Mr. Rothman uh, has proposed, because it's permanent. You can't unpack the court because judges have life tenure. In other words, it gives immediate and full control over everything in the court to the government. Uh, on the other hand, everything being discussed in Israel is reversible because it's legislation that the next Knesset can simply um, can simply overturn. They're not going to add five judges at once. They're going to change the mechanism. Um, and when the next government takes power, it can use the same mechanism to appoint its people. What they're saying is they don't want one judge from the government in this coalition. They want absolute power. Thank you. Thank you. That was that was an extraordinary analysis. I want to take some questions from our audience. I want to start with a question from National uh, Board Member Paul Tartell, who was also part of the Israel, the ZOA Israel mission last year that I mentioned earlier. Uh, excuse me, Paul. Uh, is co-chair of the national board uh, and, and down in Florida. Here's his question. Since Israel does not have a constitution, how can Israel legislatively rein in the court if the court can override anything that the legislature does? Israel, he says, has created a monster uh, and which he's calling judicial tyranny. So how does that all compute? How can, how can this be? Uh, so it's first of all, Israel didn't create this. The court created this. Okay. Um, this was this was not this system was not established by legislation. Um, it's not the case that the court can strike down any legislation. It's the case. Uh, presumably, they should not be able to strike down basic laws. It's the case that they claim to be able or have suggested that they may strike down any legislation. Um, if they choose to do so, if they tr strike to you know, if after all of their talk about conflict of interest about impartiality. They try to strike down the laws that govern the structure of the, of, of the court itself um, and say the way that the, way that the power that we have grabbed is untouchable forever, it would obviously create a significant constitutional crisis, a terrible constitutional crisis. We have a question from my colleague, Liz Burney, who's our special projects director. Why isn't one of the reforms proposed the proposal to uh, insert a mechanism for the Knesset to impeach uh, a member of the Supreme Court. But would that be appropriate? I'm not going to speak for uh, Simcha. Uh, what, would, what would you do if you were? I, 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 I think what I would say, what I would say is I think these are very these reforms were introduced 
to try to appeal to a broad range of people, to be mild, and not to be seen as aggressive. Now, just to show you how far we are from America, in America, not only does the government, the political branches, pick the Supreme Court judges, uh, they can theoretically, they have the power over impeachment, has not been uh, used so much, but it is a power that they in fact clearly have, and the Supreme Court has affirmed that they have that uh, power, and they need not impeach for crime. In Israel, it's the opposite. Now, in America, why can Congress impeach the uh, Supreme Court? Because the Constitution says so. In Israel, even though the Constitution or no law says so, the Supreme Court has declared that it can impeach the government and now maybe even the uh, the prime minister. Administer, yeah. But there's no need to, uh, you know, impeachment in America has not been used much, much at all. So it's not really a necessary remedy if the judges are picked with some taking into account of shifting democratic coalitions. Now, as you as you know, the 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 media, the Israeli media, particularly, and and politicians in the opposition, and all kinds of other people are claiming that that what uh, M.K. Rotman is is promoting and introducing is going to destroy democracy. Um, you know, the formulation throughout the world is that Israel is a Jewish and democratic state. Was that phrase, in your opinion, destroying democracy, introduced deliberately to try to harm Israel's relationships with America, with the Europeans, other democracies, other Western nations, in sort of a, you know, if we're going to destroy the whole thing if we can't have our own way? Is, is that, and I don't want to put words into your mouth or, or his mouth, but is yeah, that- I don't want to psychoanalyze anything. So, uh, I'm so, so, say again, I'm sorry. Let me see if Simcha, Sim, you want to answer that? I don't know if he's still here. Okay, so let me say, I don't know about, you know, the particular language about the end of democracy, but clearly there's an effort by opponents of this to use this to antagonize Israel's relations, to flame, to flame up this issue, to run, and they've actually said, uh, it's been written in the papers by opponents, that, look, you know, we can't stop this politically because we're in the minority, let us run to America and Europe and get them to put external pressure on Israel. And so they're having the European, the Council of Europe, the Venice Commission pressure Israel. Uh, they're having the United States pressure Israel. Now, if they were simply to come to America and say, hey, you know, in Israel, what they're going to do is they're going to give the Knesset some say in appointing judges. America is going to be like, okay. And um, we're going to let the Knesset, we're going to let the Knesset change laws if the, they don't think the Supreme Court interpreted them correctly. America will be like, yeah, okay, we, we do that too. So you have to come and say, it's the end of democracy, if you hope to you know, get foreign countries to be interested in the details of the power of the Israeli attorney general. Right? If you come and say to the America, you know, the attorney general is not going to be able to argue against the government in court. They'll be like, what? He can do that? <laughs> They'd say that in Europe. He can do that? I don't know if a European country where the attorney general can argue against the government in court. Um, so you need to up the stakes. And the goal is clearly to inflict foreign pressure and then use that foreign pressure it's the same with the economic pressure to scare off businesses to tell businesses don't come here it's the end of democracy and then say hey look the businesses are running away but the businesses are not running away but the few that are leaving are you know some of them are politically motivated uh, um and uh you know but some are re it's a second order effect in response to the hysteria that has been created to by by the critics and one thing I want to point out, there's been a lot of talk about leaving, people leaving, all the, all the tech people leaving, the smart, secular people who support the country leaving. I hear this all the time. Um, I think one reason that the right, in particular, the religious Zionist party that M.K. Rothman uh, represents, are in power now and um, have a majority is because all of the years that they were not in power, indeed, the years their values and their voters were getting trampled, literally, like in Gush Katif. They did not say, oh, we don't like the way you're running the country, right? When Aaron Barak declared his judicial revolution and took out power to exclude them, to exclude the Detim and the Mizrahim, they didn't say, you know what, this is a judicial dictatorship, which, you know, you can believe it is. So our response is, we're going to bring international pressure on Israel and or take our toys and leave. Rather, they said, we're going to work inside. Israel is our supreme value. Israel is our value, even if we disagree 
fundamentally with how it's being run and actually don't you know think it has a massive dictatorship problem or democracy deficit in favor of the court, uh, we're going to stay here. We're going to keep our toys here. Um, and and that buy-in is, of course, you know, that's that that's why, in fact, um, they're uh, th th they now have a majority. Um, and I think it's a self-defeating behavior uh, um, by, by by the opponents because this contingent relationship with Israel is is, is never going to command the respect of the of the masses. A hmm. uh, question from my colleague uh, Alan Jay, and I'm going to elaborate uh, on it. Uh, he asks, why doesn't Israel create an official constitution? So I'm going to add, what would it take for that to happen? Could could the Israeli government have a, a codified constitution so that this is, quote unquote, on paper? Uh, why hasn't it happened? What would it take? No, they could not have one. Everyone agrees it's a nice idea. And they don't have it, not because of not having thought of it or no one having mentioned it. Um, to get a constitution in the sense of a real American style constitution, you need a super majority to agree on certain principles. And there's just no agreement on those principles uh, that can or command a broad, uh, you know, it was hard enough to establish a government with 61 uh, votes. How are they going to get, you know, some kind of like 80, 80, 80 votes? And also there's a real problem of trust, right? Right now the right doesn't trust the judges. They, you know, they have lost their trust, so they cannot be, you know, they're not going to be trusted with much. The left feels they have lost the trust of the elected politicians um, because they said because of criminal problems, um, and so no one trusts, uh, no one trusts anyone. Uh, you know, it's very hard to create a constitution from nothing in the middle of a country, right? It's easiest to do in the beginning or to modify an existing one. I thank you so much uh, for your, your analysis, uh, your time uh, today with us. Uh, your insights are, are brilliant as always, and it really is a privilege uh, and honor for us to, to have had uh, your insights and, and wisdom on these issues. Professor Eugene Kondorovich, thank you so much. And I'm sure we'll be seeing you uh, in the media as this Supreme Court uh, judicial reform situation uh, goes forward. Thank you so much. Be well. Thank you. Take it. I want to again uh, thank everybody for being with us today. I want to encourage you to please support the Zionist Organization of America. Make a donation. Do it today while you're thinking about it. All the links, all the information to reach us, to support us are in the chat room. Please consider going with ZOA on the Israel mission in, in uh, June. It will be a leadership mission. Uh, and again, there's details about that in the chat room. I want to thank my colleagues. Alan Jay, Karen uh, Amoyal, Stuart Pavlak uh, for hosting and for coming up with uh, the topic of the webinar. Uh, please look for our upcoming events in, in emails that we'll be having in-person events, other webinars will be coming up. We've got an event coming up in Philadelphia. If you're not on our email list, please uh, send an email to office at zoaphilly.org. That's office at zoaphilly.org. We'll let you know about our upcoming event taking place in March. I want to thank you again for joining us. When a recording of this is available, please make sure other people see it. Please do the advocacy that I talked about earlier. Make sure that as many people as you can reach get the facts, not the lies in the media, not the bias in the media. And that includes, includes elected officials, uh, members of, of your congregation, your friends, your social media, your email contacts, please help get the word out. Also in the chat is a wonderful column by Mort Klein and Liz Burney explaining some of the details of why these reforms are, are worthy and good and important and positive. Please read that. Please get that out. Thank you very much. And if I did not get to your question, I know there were many questions. I'm, I apologize. Uh, we just have limited time with our guests, so uh, sorry for that. But again, please support us, and we'll see you on the next ZOA webinar. Good day.